EU plus EU 2024. Hello, I'm Vlad Palku. We are here live at the European Parliament in Brussels for a debate as part of the EU plus EU 2024 and beyond project co-financed by the European Parliament providing you with information about uh, the European election schedule for June. Under this project, won by the Romanian public broadcaster, Radio Romania produces podcasts, video animations and infographics on European topics, as well as a series of debates, two of which were already held here in Brussels in November. I will be chairing today's panel, which will focus on what we can expect from the future European election and how we bring young people to vote. Um, the European Parliament was not involved in the preparation of this debate and in no case is responsible for or bound by the information or opinions here expressed. That said, let me introduce today's panelists, Marian Jean Marinescu from the group of the European People's Party and Vice Chair of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. Hello. Hello. Alex Aju Saliba from the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats and also Vice Chair of the Committee on Petitions. Welcome. Thanks. We're also joined by Dragos Puslaru from Renew Europe and Chair of the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs. Hello. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, we are also joined by Olivia Banet, Associate Director at Varian Global Research and Public Policy Centre. Hello. Hi, happy to be here. Thanks everyone for coming out. So we're headed towards a new round of European elections this year. And according to recent surveys, we've had um, a Eurobarometer survey published at the uh, start of December. Um, people under 35 years of age are among the most optimistic about the future of Europe. And um, young people have high hopes for Europe and it is up to the European Parliament to stand up, answer, rise to the challenge and meet their expectations in a way that they are aligned with um, the founding principles of the European Union as a project of peace and prosperity. However, in the last 30 years of its establishment, um, the EU has undergone many phases of transformation and um, the, founding, uh, the vision of the founding fathers of the EU has radically changed um, um, in a way that um, it, people expect to see quick results and that's true of young people in particular. How do we um, mitigate young people's expectations when it comes to policy making here at the European Parliament. Uh, Marian Jean Marinescu, perhaps you will start and then um, if anyone wants to intervene and add something or follow up on what's been said, feel free to do that, please. Yes, there are elections in six months, maybe less than six months. And uh, these elections are uh, organized in a very, let's say, special uh, period because uh, we are coming from pandemic, uh, we are coming from the energy crisis, prices are up everywhere. Uh, there is a war uh, produced by, by Russia, there is another war in, uh, in Gaza, Israel. Uh, there is the, the pressure of migration. And there is also uh, this activity of the, of the Parliament, European Parliament and Council, of course, and Commission on Green Deal. So uh, it's a very special uh, uh, period with uh, all over Europe, to be honest, the, the activity of the, of the uh, parties in governments was not so... Uh, 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 I don't know, I don't like really not to say good, but uh, people didn't like it, yeah? It's, uh, it's a lot of populism that is going up, even in this house, yeah? A lot, yeah? People are working for Facebook, for Instagram, for TikTok, a little bit disconnected of the reality. So, in this situation, in this peri in such periods, if we do not have a large participation to the, to the vote, to have opinion of a lot of, uh, par, uh, a large part of the, of the voters, we shall have distortion for sure. So uh, I think that we have to bring to the vote everybody, not only young people, yeah? Because I think that there are also 
different uh, ages that uh, edge uh, that are 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 in favor of of uh, Europe, and this should be done only through uh, uh, presenting the activity, good or bad. I don't know regarding the Green Deal in the last three years because Parliament has something to show. Yeah, in this uh, what uh, was done in in uh, in this four years, and with a very aggressive campaign on on social media because that is the the way to communicate today. That's my my very general uh, uh, opinion. Dragos Peslaru, what's the best way to go about it? I think that the, the two questions that you ask are interlinked. Um, we we all hope for having the elections that will allow us to continue to strengthen the European project, to make it better, to pursue the enlargement path, to be sure that we have uh, the ever closer union ideal still there. And for that, and that's my first thesis, that you will not be able to build a more digital Europe, a greener Europe, without the support of the younger generation because they are natively digital, so they should be able to help us as, you know, the most with that. And they are dreaming about a world that is actually not wasting resources and, you know, coming up uh, with, with a footprint that will allow them as a generation to, to enjoy um, all, all the things that we have uh, or we had in the past. So my first argument is that there is no way to have a stronger Europe without being sure that we have the young people on board. Now, we've done a few things this mandate to go in that direction. I will start with the response to the pandemics. We know that there was also in the research activity a lot written about the, the risk of having a lockdown generation. I mean, we've more or less, because of the pandemics, we, we had the young generation lost two years of their most important part of their formation, you know, socializing being part of a community. And our main instrument of response, the Re Recovery and Resilience Facility or the Next Generation EU, was there to prove solidarity and to help the young generation as well. And I personally and my political group put forward, um, on top of the European Commission proposal that was focusing only on digital and green, put forward a pillar on the children and youth. And right now we have 50 billion euros that are dedicated across the EU for education, training, and helping children and youth. And this is one of the most important achievements of this particular mandate because we have been thinking about it. In the initial proposal of the Commission, if you do control F trying to find the word young or children or youth, there was nothing. So the Parliament was the one, was the institution that put that forward. The second thing is in my own committee that I'm sharing with, uh, with Alex uh, here, um, we've been doing a lot of things looking at and listening to the young generation. For instance, we had a, a legislative uh, initiative report on traineeships. And this is, has been asked a lot by the young generation to allow them uh, an easier path from education to getting a job. And to have decently paid traineeships, that's one of the things of the crusades that we've been doing in the European Parliament. And last but not least, very, very important, housing. This has been discussed maybe too little um, in, the, in the European Parliament. It is a national competence, that's the reason for which. But I believe that through EPOC, the platform that is about combating homelessness, and then right now the new initiatives, at the end of the mandate by the Belgian presidency on housing and our own work in the committee, we are there for young, uh, young, children, young people uh, to, to, to have a better view on what's happening. Young people need to participate, young people need to be represented, and if they feel that they are represented, they will come to vote. So it's actually a vicious, vicious circle that needs to be transformed into a virtuous circle. Alex Aju Saliba, uh, traditionally, before the election, candidates and parties uh, usually tend to focus on their hardline segments, people who bring in most of the votes. What's the situation in your group? Do you have something in mind to boost uh, voter turnout uh, among uh, young people? No, I think, to reply also to your first question, the European project is an ongoing project. So with each geopolitical situation that we face, with each novel situation that we face, we faced many different challenges during this legislature, from the pandemic to the war, to the war of aggression against Ukraine, to the 
war that we are still facing right now in, in Gaza through the high inflationary rates. I think that we learned a lot of lessons from all of these experiences and ultimately to be able to pull out the vote and to have higher voting turnout, which is so crucial because ultimately the European Parliament is the only democratically elect elected institution from all the European institutions. Therefore, if our citizens want to send a message, want to give a direction to the European Union, where do we want the European project to go? To the left, to the right? We want a populist um, union, something which I totally don't agree with, or we want a more social um, Europe? And I'm going to turn now to your question. As, as a political family, the SND uh, political group wants to continue to push forward the idea of um, having a more social Europe, having a more social Europe in many different uh, aspects and uh, segments, from uh, environmental sustainability, but also to enhancing consumer rights and also protecting the most vulnerable consumers in the internal market. Uh, but right now, I think that this is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing from housing. As Dragos has rightly pointed out, although we don't have uh, competence to act when it comes to housing, I think that there we should and we must send very strong messages that ultimately this is one of the biggest challenges that many of our member states are facing. But also uh, by tackling other initiatives that Ultimately, our citizens will say the European Parliament is a useful um, institution. Dragos also mentioned paid internships. Um, so these are all aspects that, tangible things, that ultimately when the European Parliament acts upon them, people will feel that the European project is still relevant to them. Because th this is something tangible that can change the quality of life of our citizens, of our youths. Therefore, I believe that during this campaign, to get out the vote as much as possible, with different opinions that we have in all the 27 different member states, I think that the most important thing that we should concentrate upon is to speak the language and speak upon the priority, priorities and struggles that our citizens are facing. Olivia Bennett, uh, you were uh, actually on the team that worked on the Eurobarometer survey. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of data that uh, you'd be eager to share with us on what young people had to say about uh, the future of Europe. What's the most striking thing that you found? Uh, I think for me, and it kind of ties in into one of the points you made about do we need to mitigate young people's expectations policy-wise from the European Union, uh, what really struck me is um, the optimism that young people show towards the Union. And it hasn't gone down, actually. If you look at 2019 uh, compared to today, young people think the European Union is a good thing, uh, either at the same rate or even more than they did uh, five years ago. And the 15 to 24-year-old group, even more. These are very young people, in some case, first-time voters. Belgium, after all, now has a voting age down to 16. So that means that we're having 16 and 17-year-olds vote for the first time. Uh, so that was very striking. However, there is this pattern, and that also is a long-standing pattern, of young people discussing politics less. And that's local politics, national politics, and also European Union politics. They like the European Union, they trust it, um, they like the parliament, they trust the institution generally, but there's just less interest in politics, and logically, they're less, less likely to vote. They don't vote out of habit. What we see with the older generations is there's a bit of this ongoing habit of, I've always voted, so I will vote for these elections as well. And young people have that much less. When we ask them, when did you decide to vote, for those who did vote in the 2019 election, they're much more likely to say, well, I decided in the last few months that I was going to vote. That means that the months now are crucial to, you know, really gather their interest and show why it's important to vote, If uh, show how it's easy to register. In some countries, they're already registered just by being, you know, on the national list. They can just go, show up at the office and vote. Uh, and this is work that has to be done now in the upcoming months so that in June uh, they can go out and vote and have their voices heard. 
Um, it's, um, we've already mentioned a lot of things that, a lot of crises that have affected um, um, the European uh, Parliament's um, five-year term that is about to end. And um, Dragos Pislaru, you are chair on the Committee on Employment. Um, um, as, as has been said so far, um, the EU, European Commission is working on the Green Deal, on um, on a number of things that um, on, on the digital market as well. Things are going in a in a way towards reform. Um, how do we make sure that our young people are ready for these changes? I think that uh, young people enjoy change more than <laughs> elderly people. So that's. If you like to change things, your main ally uh, should be the younger generation. How do we because make they're, they sure have, they're ready? Yeah, I mean, uh, they have less preconceptions and they are eager to, to, to work with. But for that, again, they, they should, you sh we should not think about them as, you know, we prepare things our own way and then we communicate to them that we have a package for them. That's the problem with it. You need to have their participation. You need the young person, people on board today, not to promise them that the future is theirs. And that's a crucial thing. So working together with them means, for instance, what the commission has been pushed by the parliament to do, to look, to have right now implemented what is called the youth test. So when you adopt a legislative act or an initiative, I mean, have you tested the impact, the generational impact? Is there a generational tension on it? Yeah, so that's actually a crucial thing to understand what young people think about and get them involved. I am also the co-chair of the Youth Task Force in Renew Europe and what we've done in Renew as a family of political parties is that we set up a co-creation process with our young political leaders representing the youth parties by saying we, it's not us the members of the parliament that will say you know what are the priorities but let's work together and the co-creation process was amazing and we have our manifesto on that then right now they, as representative of the young generation in their own political chapters, they can say, we work together with the parliament representatives and we have this manifesto. And that's actually a way to get them on board. And another thing which is crucial is that we have actually tried in the European Parliament to give one entire year dedicated to that, the European Year of Youth. And right now we have the European Year of Skills where we try also to do the same thing. Was that a 100% successful project? Mm. Probably not necessarily, because we are still not there. It's more like what we can do for our young people. And the whole point is not to pretend that we deliver for the young people, but to get them on board. And the onboarding thing is actually the crucial thing that will lead, exactly as Iba said, also to their feeling towards election. Do they feel involved in the process? Or, do they, or are they going to just to be asked about, what do you think about that policy or the other policy? And I think that the new generation is by far more active and connected, generally speaking, than any of the previous generations. They are aware of things. They may have a problem in you know, discerning fake from, you know, true, truth from fake news, and then we need to help them. But on one hand, it's clear that they have access to everything. So if you get them on board, the word of mouth and the social media and, the, and getting it viral, that's, that's actually going to be very quickly if we do the right thing. That means involving them into you know, how to shape Europe in the future. So that's the key thing and that's what I am trying to, to reinvent myself and to try to do as much as possible. Alex, uh, talking about youth participation, uh, young people always have their immediate interests and concerns and there's this sense that um, whatever happens in Brussels stays in Brussels. They often feel disconnected uh, um, from um, uh, the policy-making process. How do we change this mindset? I think that although we are doing a lot here in the European Parliament, one of the biggest struggles that we are having is when it comes to communication. When it comes to communicating in the right way what we are doing in simple terminology, not in very bombastic terminology or, or terms that people don't understand. And this is not only applicable to youths, it's also applicable to different sectors within our communities. I think that the biggest challenge is challenge that we have, and we shouldn't act upon this challenge only six months before the elections. I think this should be and this must be an ongoing process. Um, is that of explaining exactly what we are doing, but not only what we are doing. The positive repercussions in the daily quality life that our youths, our citizens would ultimately benefit from what we are doing. And ultimately, if we manage to explain exactly what we are doing, what is going on, why it is so important for youths 
for our citizens to participate in these elections, how crucial it is the role of the European Parliament when it comes uh, as a co-legislator uh, in, in, in all the legislative uh, process. I think that youths will participate more. And we, during this legislature, we managed to uh, adopt a number of pieces of legislation which tangibly are also having a positive effect on the life uh, of, 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 of our youths, from the simple universal charger, uh, which, again, when it comes to different devices that youths use on a daily basis, from hybrids to laptops to smartphones to digital cameras, earbuds, headphones, I think this is a tangible achievement that, that this legislature has achieved. And this was a push from the European Parliament to other different rights. For example, the right to disconnect that we are working upon right now and we will be having a proposal on the table uh, in a couple of weeks' time from the European Commission, a push from our ample committee. This is something that youths, when you meet our younger generation, they complain all the time that digital equipment, um, pl digital platforms, online platforms are affecting their daily quality time of rest. Uh, is, 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 is blurring the line between rest time and working time. Again, this is also an achievement of the European Parliament. If it wasn't for the European Parliament, this right would have never seen the light of day. So these are all tangible results, tangible ambition that the European Parliament is pushing forward. Therefore, I believe that the biggest challenge now that we have is to communicate as much as we can what we achieved and also what our ambitions are. And, and this is also really important, what we are at stake of losing. Because ultimately, as MMP Marinesco has also pointed out, the issue of far-right populi populism at an EU level. We have seen a number of election results uh, in a number of member states during these past months. And ultimately, this is also a challenge that we have. So if <laughs> you don't participate in this electoral process, you can ultimately be voting directly to these populist parties who can give a very different direction to the European project. Marianja Marinescu talking about um, communication and um, it's clear that um, more information and more education are critical to um, ensuring that um, uh, we can raise awareness among young people. And um, Parliament and uh, the Council are going to great lengths to uh, ensure that, to mobilize uh, young people. What's the best way to get this message across? You ask about uh, the level of preparation of young, yes? Young people to face what is coming. That as well, yeah. Uh, it's already understood also in these uh, institutions here because all the new, all the, the legislation, uh, pieces of legislation with new things in, yeah? Digitalization, green things and so on, are including also provisions for skills, how to prepare the skills to prepare people to participate in that uh, activity, because otherwise you uh, digitalize and uh, uh, nobody can, uh, can do it. So I understood differently a little bit the, the question. This is my answer to it, and uh, this is a very good uh, <coughs> thing. Now, about uh, elections. First, you have example of Poland. Yeah, a large participation changed totally the, the result of the elections. This is an, uh, an example. At the same time, you have already two examples. Last uh, uh, year, uh, what does it mean populism? Netherlands and Slovakia, yeah? With not a large participation there, but uh, with a lot of, uh, I don't know, campaign on social media. And the results were not uh, uh, at least from my uh, opinion, yeah, uh, are not um, so uh, so good for Europe, yeah, with extremists when in there. We already have a problem because there are one, two, sometimes heads of states that are opposing to 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 all the other um, uh, uh, members of European Council opinion. 
only one, you know, unanimity. One is against, you cannot do what the, all the others uh, are doing. So all these are challenges. And I think that the political parties, the traditional ones, they have to understand that the most important thing in the campaign, in this, in this campaign, this year, is to make people understand what does it mean the value of EU and what is the danger in this moment to bring them to the vote. Of course, in a campaign, you cannot avoid the competition, yeah? But this time, you have to focus more on the, on the, the I don't know, uh, transferring to the people the reality. Because uh, otherwise, uh, with a full of populist and the right side, the extreme right side or extreme left side members in the European Parliament, will be very difficult to, to put then uh, uh, a commission and uh, 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 a structure of the parliament and so on, and then to legislate. And don't forget about the elections in the United States. Yes? Because we are speaking also about populism. Yeah? If the result is Trump, that's clear that we shall have, uh, we shall have, have face a, a provocation, yeah? oh, a challenge, a big one. That's, for me, is very clear, yeah? So we have to think to, we have to have a strong um, uh, e EU to face all these challenges. Migration is not finished, the wars are not finished, yeah, the pandemic is uh, uh, there and there. The, the, all the Green Deal, the Fit for 55 package introduced a lot of pressure on the, on the society and on the economy. And the effects will, will be seen very soon, yeah? So 26, 27, 25, sorry, 26, 27. So if we do not have a strong uh, EU, we shall face a lot of problems. Look at the farmers in the street uh, everywhere in, uh, in Europe. So this is what we have, to, we have to do to young people, yeah, yeah, but also to everybody, to come to the vote in order to provide the, the reality from the, from the opinion of the people. Otherwise, social media will uh, make the, the, will create the result. I don't want to, to give an example back, yeah, with uh, Brexit and with, even with uh, uh, Trump. So we need, again, maybe it's strange, but political parties, traditional ones, have, they have to focus on explaining what is the EU, why we need a strong one, and what is the danger to, be, to happen. Olivia, uh, talking about the threats of populism, another big threat that is most likely sh and surely um, to impact uh, the election process this year is disinformation. And we're all exposed to fake news, to disinformation. We see it in our line of work, in our private lives as well. And it's often hard for us as journalists to spot fake news and do the fact-checking, let alone young people who are, in that respect, prime targets of disinformation. How do we protect young voters from such phenomena? That's a difficult question. Um, there's two sides to this. Uh, I would say one is much more legislative. It's what can be put in place um, so that fake news cannot run around, let's say, unstopped. And of course, you know, at Varian, we really work with facts and uh, what people think. So that's not so much my field. The other one is uh, engaging a conversation. And what we see is that young people are interested in differentiating fake news from real news. You know, they're not uh, taking in information past the view without worrying what is true and what is not true. So there is an interest there. Therefore, based on that, what I would say is that you could start a conversation with young people to see what they are already doing uh, as far as differentiating what they think is fake from what they think is true, and from there come up with some sort of easy manual rules, guidelines, inspired by what young people are already doing. And maybe they're actually doing all the right actions, they're just, you know, not sure if that really helps, and therefore they're more likely to believe what someone says. Um, word of mouth is one of the key sources that young people cite when we ask them, well, how have you heard this news or, you know, what kind of news do you listen to? 
of course, social media is up there, but they really also talk with family and friends, and that really also informs them. And that's hard to verify. If you trust a friend, do you trust a family member? If they tell you something, you're more likely to believe it. So even someone who really um, checks their news might fall prey to that. So having a conversation to make sure that everyone is aware of the existence of fake news uh, and what can easily be done to make sure that it's fake or not, or if you should maybe question it, would be one of the ways, based on the research that Varian has done, that you could uh, help young people. And people generally, to be honest, uh, differentiate what is fake and what is true. That's the thing, uh, because we all have, uh, to some extent, uh, a certain degree of confirmation bias, in mm -hmm. that we often seek information that falls in line with, with our belief system. And uh, Alex, um, um, we've seen that uh, young people are particularly exposed to the threat of disinformation. How do we help them sift through the information and um, uh, differentiate between what's true and what isn't? We have done also a lot in this regard in this legislature in the European Parliament with two very important pieces of legislation. One of them I have been working very closely on it as also the uh, rapporteur uh, for the own legislative initiative in the European Parliament before the Commission came up with the proposal, the Digital Services Act, basically. And this is something that we need to communicate to people and to our younger voters. We managed to overhaul a piece of legislation which was controlling the way that Platforms, which have become the public utility, utilities of our time, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, X. Our younger generation, our citizens are using these platforms on a daily basis to communicate with their families, with their friends, to share information, to buy uh, online tickets, to, 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 to buy services, to buy goods. So during this legislature, we managed to update 20-year-old rules, the e-commerce directive, which came into force much before these uh, platforms came even into existence. So we were basically trying to regulate novel technologies, which have fundamental impacts, such as disinformation, misinformation, fake news, um, illegal content, which can easily be um, uh, circulated online. So we managed to uh, <laughs> formulate and approve and enforce the Digital Services Act to be able to have a stronger notice and action mechanism, for example, to remove um, uh, illegal content, to remove disinformation, fake news online as much as possible. But apart from that, a couple of months ago, we also managed, and this is very crucial for the European Parliament elections, because ultimately, what is the business model, model of these platforms? It's advertising. So the more clickbait there is, the more sensational is the content it is. And this can easily happen uh, uh, during European Parliament elections, because now we are not only having elections in one member, st member state, but in 27 different member states. So there we are at, at a very big risk when it comes to misinformation, disinformation and fake news. And the European Parliament and also the Commission managed to tackle this issue and prevent a lot of issues that can happen also during the electoral campaign with the political ads and the regulation of political ads. So more transparency there, um, less targeted acts, uh, ads, advertisement. Therefore, you cannot target indiscriminately or with a lot of criteria your electorate, especially when it comes to targeting youths and the youth votes. In the DSA, we managed for the first time to make it illegal, the targeting of minors under the age of 16. So this is also another novel concept. Therefore, although education, although the role when it comes to EU funding and, for example, initiatives such as this one that we are, uh, <laughs> that we are doing right now, uh, communication initiatives whereby we, com we can communicate our work in a non-partisan way, in a, in a knowledge-based way. Apart from these initiatives and initiatives funded directly by the European Parliament and the European Commission, ultimately we also need this kind of legislation to be able to provide a safer ecosystem, the online ecosystem. Therefore, I think it will be a safer online environment during the campaign, but still, we have a lot to do during the next legislature when it comes to 
um, strengthening the digital single market and also fighting disinformation and fake news. Mariangela Marinescu, speaking of online presence, um, um, it's often the case that uh, young people um, follow their MPs on social media as well. And um, they follow their posts and they follow their... Um, it, it sometimes happens that MPs post a number of times a day on, on various segments. But maybe at the end of the day, young people say that these things are not enough and it's the simple things that matter. Do you think that the mission of MPs, MEPs, should be widened so as to also give young people a voice to talk to them? Do you think that you should be closer to them? What's your approach? Yes, we, uh, we were always um, uh, very close to the, to the young people. If I look to the, uh, the... We organize, EPP organize each year, except pandemic, a big forum with hundreds, some four, five hundreds of, of young people coming from all the all member states. One week in Brussels, and I, if I look to, to these uh, young people, I can, can be optimist, but these are young people uh, uh, that are uh, implicated in, in, in the politics. So uh, the issue is that we did a lot in this parliament in this uh, term, in all areas, on initiative reports or laws. The problem is to, for the member states to uh, uh, apply these laws and for us to go to the, to, the, to the people, young, not young, to explain them. This is what we have to do, because we have uh, something to, uh, to say. And in the same time, because this is the way in, uh, in our society, to explain what could happen if will be a populistic parliament or a right side uh, parliament, uh, uh, far right side, yeah, extreme. This should be explained. This is what we have to do. And of course, in, in, if you ask me about my group, yeah, as, uh, we, there are prepared uh, different um, positions of the group in different areas. It will be a Congress in Bucharest in March, where we uh, decide who will be the, the front runner of, uh, of the elections and what it will be the program of, uh, of, the, of the group. But it's depending a lot of, on, the, uh, on the national level, what, how they will uh, uh, do it. Olivia, on a lighter and funnier note, um, uh, the European Commission Vice President Margarita Skinas, uh, earlier this month, um, during a press briefing, he came up with a solution to boost voter turnout in the upcoming election. And he actually gave Taylor Swift as an example, uh, due to her um, involvement um, in the US election, trying to mobilize young voters uh, through Instagram, uh, through shout outs during her concerts and other actions. And he said, quote, it's young people who can mobilize young people more than commissioners. I very much hope that someone from her media team follows this press conference and relays our request to her. Well, Taylor Swift being expected to perform in Paris on Europe Day. Um, do you think um, this is the right way to, use, to go about it? Um, should uh, we also use uh, young influencers and celebrities who sort of speak the, young, the language of young people to appeal to them, to draw them closer to politics? I think something that needs to be said first uh, is that young people see the importance of voting by itself. Uh, we mentioned the year of youth in 2022. Uh, actually, we did uh, your barometer specifically on youth and, youth and democracy in 2022. And we asked young people what they thought was the best way to engage with decision makers. And voting is the first most mentioned choice uh, by 39% of young people. And then there's, of course, social media uh, discussions, but voting is up there. So there is an interest. What needs to be done is to transform that interest into the same then actions then for the other age groups and actually drive them to register to vote and then vote. In that perspective, I do think that having more engagement from people that these young people see every day, it doesn't have to be influencers, it can also be um, you know, their peers, it can even be discussed in classrooms, teachers, professors, just so they have more of an everyday connection to 
voting uh, and kind of the politics that go on in the European Parliament. Since we know they talk about politics less, they're going to be less aware about what's going on generally. So we need to find a way to bring, let's say, the politics to them and to bring the importance of voting to them. And there's various ways that this can be done, of course. A very famous celebrity uh, tweeting about it is one way, but more realistically, um, we can think of student ambassadors, we can think of uh, platforms that have very simplified programs just so it's quick and easy for them to go and think, ah, okay, I understand this, rather than go and think, I'm completely lost, I don't really understand why this political party is talking about a national issue, but I thought these were the European elections. And it can be very complicated for someone looking at it for the first time. Time. So simplifying it, though, of course, is imperfect, is one way to first engage these young people. Uh, and then, of course, there's various other ways, discussions in classrooms, uh, open debates in a, in a small town on a small scale, uh, generally finding a way to really bring this to young people, whether it's with stars or without. And I think that certainly makes for a much more interesting debate, uh, longer than uh, the time allows for today. Thank you for your presence here today. Thanks, thanks, you. thanks for your input. Um, I personally very excited to see what uh, the future legislature will do for Europe's youth. Um, I'm Vlad Palko. This has been a U plus EU 2024 and beyond debate. Thanks for joining us. U plus EU 2024.